Our first speaker uh, is a woman who made history, uh, Miriam Coronel Ferrer, a Filipino peace negotiator. Uh, she's the first and only female uh, chief negotiator in the world to sign a final peace accord. Um, Miriam uh, uh, Coronel Ferrer has been deployed to support uh, the UN uh, uh, work uh, in Afghanistan, Iraq, Kosovo, Maldives, uh, and more advising on peace process design and modalities of inclusion. Uh, in addition, before that, she was uh, extens uh, extensively involved in civil society campaigns, co-leading the initiative to draft the National Action Plan on Women, Peace and Security that was adopted by the Philippine government in 2010. Uh, she's a full professor at the University of the Philippines. Miriam, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Neta and Huda and Itak Maaki, the steering committee for inviting me to be with you today uh, uh, and to meet uh, the women uh, who are very much in the forefront of advancing UN Security Resolution 1325 um, in that part of the world. So I come from Manila, which is part of Southeast Asia. And uh, uh, this kind of uh, coming together of activists of civil society is really for my, uh, very much in my comfort zone although I represented the government in the negotiations with the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, uh, who was advocating for uh, self-governance in um, the southernmost part of the country uh, for their group of communities, their people whom they call the Bangsamoro. Um, my, my, I came from civil society, got into government, and uh, finally was able to work with them on this um, peace agreement. So then I'm back here uh, among, you, among you in uh, civil society. But just let me start by saying a little bit about our, our uh, con the armed conflict in our country. It, it basically was an effort to uh, find a good resolution to a conflict coming from an armed conflict that was about 50 years old, uh, representing a group of um, the Muslim uh, major minority population. It's an ethno-political identity. It's made up of different ethnic groups who have come together, um, advancing their own national identity. And the idea was to find a place for that kind of national identity called the Bangsamoro within the bigger framework of Filipino identity or the Philippine identity and the Philippine nation state. Of course, in the beginning, they wanted independence, but for a peace agreement, the idea was to bring them uh, into a, a broader political arrangement where uh, self-governance can be meaningfully uh, exercised. So that was the conflict. The identity question that was at the forefront was between a majority uh, uh, population and a minority ethnopolitical identity. And where is the gender question here? Well, obviously it doesn't come uh, evidently in the beginning, given that the social cleavage, social political cleavage that was being addressed had to do with this kind of you know, ethnopolitics. Um, and it had to be brought to the forefront, definitely. It had to be asked, um, what about parity of esteem, not only between the majority and minority population, but also among the men and women in your communities, as well as in the broader Philippine community. And uh, it wasn't easy to do that. Uh, we were negotiating with an Islamic group, moderate one, but still socially conservative. Um, they were all men, and they considered themselves representative of their community because they came from the different ethnic groups that make up that community. But yes, they were all men. And it took some time for them to slowly agree to bring in more women, more women into inside the room through consultants and, and um, members of technical working groups. Uh, uh, and eventually be able to also accept some of the gender provisions that we wanted to uh, to introduce. Um, we did it very 
uh, gradually. Of course, there were moments when we had to really be more assertive about it. One of the things that we did actually was to turn over a copy of UN Security Resolution 1325, requesting them to study this and see what kind of, um, what kind of elements we can put into the agreement as well. And we did manage to do that when we talked about guaranteeing the meaningful political participation of women. We emphasized political participation because women were already actually very active in the economic sphere, but it's in the public space where decisions are being made where they are hardly present. So that took some time to be accepted. And then later on, it slowly became easier to introduce this gender dimension in the different elements, whether on the matter of representation in the new political arrangement, the autonomous government that was going to be set up, a share in the government budget through gen for gender and development, and also special focus on affected women and not just the armed combatants or mostly men, in any case, in the peace dividends that were to come. So this is, this is our experience, and we can see that there have been several pathways precisely to bring women into the, into the fold. If we're looking at the, the goal, one of the important goals of UN Security Resolution, which is to see more women up there in the formal process. Women, there are a good number of women doing work on the ground, but they're hardly seen over there. And I think uh, it's very good to, it will be very good to look at the experience of Northern Ireland in the women's coalition, because what we see here is precisely that kind of attempt to bring women across different social, eth ethno-religious communities together. In the women's coalition in Northern Ireland, um, they had to fight for their space inside the negotiating room, which was through an election, putting up a political party and getting two seats because in any case, the other political parties that represent only one of the, con you know, the conflict communities and was not able to precisely bridge the, the, the two communities together had only male candidates. And the only way they could get in was to put up their own political party cross community, which is really something that they brought into the process. They spoke for two communities and not just one community and certainly that's probably one of the, um, one of the um, uh, major contributions of a lot of women in a lot of processes. We saw that also in uh, Somalia, where they organized themselves not according to their clans, but creating what is called the sixth clan, where the women from the different clans came together and spoke as women and brought in uh, the agenda of uh, women in the dialogue uh, process. There are many, many more examples the way this could be done in Colombia, in Sri Lanka. There was a gender subcommission, which enabled a lot of women to come in. And of course, there are also mechanisms outside the room. But let me end uh, here now with your one specific concern on the National Action Plan. We adopted our first National Action Plan in 1325. It was a civil society-led process, and I, I can imagine which is what's going on now in Israel, as well as in Palestine, um, led by civil society. And what's really beautiful about this is that it brought together activists from diff three different social movements, the human rights movements, the women's movement, and the peace movement. And they infuse each other with that kind of, you know, the framework and thinking that maybe each of these different movements uh, sort of um, have forgotten or not fully articulated. And that's the beauty precisely of UN Security Resolution 1325 in that they are able to see the interconnections in these uh, different aspects of our quest for social justice. Thank you. I will end there. And I am sure that um, uh, you will carry the torch for your own communities. And I applaud you for that. Thank you very much.